Mark 10, verses 32 through 52. And they were on the road going up to Jerusalem, and Jesus was walking ahead of them. And they were amazed, and those who followed were afraid. And taking the twelve again, he began to tell them what was to happen to him, saying, See, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered over the chief priests and the scribes, and they will condemn him to death, and deliver him over to the Gentiles. And they will mock him, and spit on him, and flog him, and kill him, and after three days he will rise. James and John, the sons of Deb and Zebedee, came up to him and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And he said to them, What do you want me to do for you? They said to him, Grant us to sit, one at your right hand, one at your left, in your glory. Jesus said to them, You do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink, or be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized? You will be baptized. Or sorry, they said, we are able. Jesus said to them, The cup that I drink, you will drink. The baptism with which I am baptized, you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand and at my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared. And when the ten heard it, they began to be indignant at James and John. And Jesus called them to him and said to them, You know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them, but it shall not be so among you. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. And they came to Jericho, and as he was leaving Jericho with his disciples and a great crowd, Bartimaeus, a blind beggar, the son of Timaeus, was sitting out by the roadside. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus! Son of David, have mercy on me. And many rebuked him, telling him to be silent. But he cried out all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped him and said, Call him. And they called the blind man, saying to him, Take heart, get up, he's calling you. And throwing off his cloak, he sprang up and came to Jesus. And Jesus said to him, What do you want me to do for you? And the blind man said to him, Rabbi, let me recover my sight. Jesus said to him, Go your way, your faith has made you well. And immediately he recovered his sight and followed him on the way. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we ask that you would speak this hour. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Whenever I was in high school, I had the privilege of going on a school trip to New York City. During school hours, on school days, we took a bus and hopped up and drove the 14 or 16 hours, whatever it was, to New York. And it's something that we had been preparing for for a long time. We had to raise money, we had to pay for this trip, and so as we would meet in class, this was our high school choir, our teacher would remind us about the protocol. Whenever you get to New York, Minimum groups of three, always with the chaperone, be back at the hotel by five so we can go for our evening outings. We talked about it in class. Well, the day came, we got on the bus to go up there, and while we're on the way, on the bus, the teacher gets up to the front of the bus. You need to remember, minimum of three people at a time, always with an adult chaperone, back at the hotel at five. Well, we continue on our journey, and as we're crossing the George Washington Bridge, going over from New Jersey into Manhattan, he gets to the front of the bus one more time, and he says, Minimum of three in a group, always an adult chaperone, back at the hotel by five. Right, as a group of 18 year olds, 15 to 18 year olds, uh, those are pretty helpful for us. We were in a strange place with strange people that none of us had ever been. Right, none of us had even taken the subway before. That was going to be a new experience for us. But the teacher repeated it so that whenever we were set loose in the wild, we would remember that those were the rules that he set for us. And in our passage today, right, as we think about where Jesus and his disciples are, they're on the way to the big city, right? They've been there before, it's familiar, but they've not been there in a while, and Jesus is, has been reminding them of something he's told them many times before, namely what's going to happen when they get there. Remember, the Gospel of Mark, Jesus, he started off with a bang. What did he do? Mark chapter 1, 
He gets on the scene and he says, repent and believe for the kingdom of God is at hand. And then immediately he starts casting out demons, healing the sick, teaching them what the kingdom of God is going to be like. He's preparing them for this moment. You don't like the Jewish government who's inept. You don't like the Roman government who's oppressive. Don't worry, there's a new kingdom coming. And then he has been telling them more and more about what his mission is like as he's come. Right? He's called the 12 disciples and he's training them. And he's told them some pretty important things about discipleship. Things that might seem counterintuitive or upside down. We gain by losing. The first will be last and the last will be first. If you want to go up, you need to go down. It seems counterintuitive to us, but that's what the kingdom will be like. And so as they're on their way to Jerusalem, Jesus is reminding them yet again what the mission is like there. The teacher is standing at the front of the bus telling them what's going to happen when they cross that bridge. And this is what we learn as Jesus teaches his disciples and talks to them and teaches them. This is what we learn today. Jesus surrenders his status for our salvation, transforming our weakness into power, our blindness into sight, and sinners into saints. I'm going to say that one more time. Jesus surrenders his status for our salvation, transforming weakness into power, blindness into sight, and sinners into saints. Well, the first thing we see in this passage is a certain fulfillment of God's word. Right, Jesus, again, we, he's there across the bridge. He's telling them the plan for the third time. In Mark chapter 8, verse 31, he told them that the Son of Man would be rejected by the scribes and the Pharisees. He would be killed and on the third day rise again. In Mark 9, 31, he tells them a little bit more details. The Son of Man would be handed over to the hands of men. They will kill him. And on the third day, he'll, be, he'll rise again. And then in Mark 10, 34 to 30, 33 to 34, in our passage today, it says this. See, we're going up to Jerusalem. Some man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the scribes. They will condemn him to death and deliver him over to the Gentiles. And they will mock him and spit on him and flog him and kill him. And after three days, he will rise. So one of the first things we learn is that there are kind of two steps to this betrayal. The Jews are going to arrest him and then they're going to condemn him. They're going to put him on trial and decide that he's deserving of death. And then they're going to hand him over to the Romans, to the non-Jewish government. And they're actually going to carry out the act. They're going to mock him. They're going to spit upon him. They're going to flog him and beat him and then eventually kill him. But note that the end is always the same. After three days, he's going to rise up from the dead. Well, I think that the actions that Jesus describes, he's not just saying in general what he knows will happen, but I think he's chosen some very specific actions because he wants us to be listening for echoes that come from the rest of the Bible. Right? Whenever he says that they will, he, they will mock him, spit upon him, flog him, and kill him, it reminds us of a figure from the Old Testament that we might call the suffering servant. Right? In the book of Isaiah, he's prophesying 700 years before the birth of Jesus. And he receives a word from the Lord. And he has these four servant songs that he sings. And as we hear what the servant says and sings, it sounds very familiar to what we see Jesus doing in the Gospels. Right? In Isaiah chapter 50, verse 6, the prophet says, I gave my back to those who strike, my cheeks to those who would pull out my beard. I hid not my face from disgust, from disgrace, and spitting. Very famously, in chapter 53, verse 3, we're told that a servant would be despised and rejected by men. As a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. This man would be mocked. And then that chapter ends in verse 12, and it says this, Therefore, this is God speaking, I will divide him a portion with the many. He shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul unto death, and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sins of many, and makes intercession for the transgressors. As we look back in God's word, whenever we see God working for our salvation, we see that he has already laid the plans out. And that what Jesus is doing as he's living and ministering, as he's on the road to Jerusalem, literally going up. I mean, Jerusalem was on a mountain, so you go up to Jerusalem. Knowing that he would die, that this would be the fulfillment of God's word for our salvation. 
700 years. Not only was the birth of Jesus prophesied, not only was his life, but also his death, and also his resurrection. Jesus has the cross in his sights. He's walking towards it. And he wants the disciples to be ready, be prepared. Well, as Jesus talks about the certain faithfulness of God's word, he also talks about the certain faith of his disciples. So having had this third lesson, you know, the third prediction of his own suffering and death, James and John, they're the sons of Zebedee, the brothers, two of Jesus' disciples, they were on the inner circle of three, Peter, James, and John. They come up to Jesus, and they say, Lord, teacher, we want you to do whatever we ask of you. Now, I have the temerity, if someone were to come up to me and say, can you do a favor for me? The first response that I say is, well, it depends, right? Jesus is a little bit more gracious than I am, and he asks, what is it that you want me to do for you? And they're pretty audacious. They say, grant us to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left, in your glory. I mean, they really go big. They don't hold anything back. Right? They know that Jesus, as the Messiah, he will be the king. And that means that as the king, he's going to reign on a throne. And if you're sitting on a throne, there are only two seats beside you, right? There's one on the right side one on the left side. Maybe Peter's not been performing so well recently, so they think we can lock this up for ourselves. Let's sign it up together. The two seats go to the top officials, and they're kind of like saying, Jesus, we know you're the Messiah. Let us be your vice Messiah. I mean, let us be your number two, your number three. We'll be there for you whenever you come in your glory. And so if you spend any time with Jesus, you might expect him to respond to this in a pretty negative way. What do you think you're asking? But he says this. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink? Are you able to be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized? And I think that they're imagining that Jesus is saying, listen, you're going to sit in my banquet hall, and so the cup that I drink in celebration, you'll drink that with me. The baptism, you remember what happened to Jesus at his baptism? The Holy Spirit descended upon him. So yeah, I mean, Jesus will take that baptism. That sounds great. Jesus then affirms, you will. You will share in that cup. You will share in that baptism. But we know that the cup that Jesus drinks is not simply the cup of feasting, but rather, as we hear often in the Old Testament, that the cup of Jesus that he would drink is the cup of suffering and agony. Right? He would be laid in the grave and walk out of that three days later, but he would die first. Whenever I played football in high school, uh, I was on the JV squad, and uh, you you know, I always want to play, right? If you could play on a Friday night, that was the apex, that was amazing. And so there'd be a few players who would follow the coach around the whole game, you know, kind of ready, put me in coach, put me in coach. The coach knew they weren't ready, but occasionally the coach would say, okay, you can go in. And what would happen on the next play, that player would get clocked. I mean, they would have to, you know, they got hit harder than they expected, and they had to come out of the game. Right? Sometimes we're like that, and that's what James and John are like here. They want to go in. They want a piece of the action. But it's going to be overwhelming. And I think it comes to a misinterpretation of what they understand the Son of Man to be. Right? The Son of Man is the title that Jesus uses most often for himself in the Gospels, and it comes from the book of Daniel, chapter 7. And it is a really glorious position. Check out, check out this in Daniel 7, 14. It says, It was given to him, that is the Son of Man, it was given to him a king, dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. But if they kept reading in their Bibles to Daniel 7 verse 21, they would notice this. The enemy, the enemy fights against the Son of Man. And in verse 21 it says, I looked and this horde, this enemy, made war with the saints, with the followers of the Son of Man, and prevailed. The enemy made war and prevailed over them until the Ancient of Days came, and judgment was given for the saints of the Most High, and the time came when the saints possessed the kingdom. There is glory coming for the Son of Man, but those who follow the Son of Man will suffer and will be prevailed over before the triumph. James and John don't quite understand that part yet. But it's important for us. Again, at times we want to be the vice Messiah. 
God, give us the glory. You, don't you need us? Don't you know what the talent that we bring to your team? But Jesus doesn't call his disciples to be vice messiahs. He, calls, if he, he doesn't call his disciples to be vice messiahs. He calls them to be followers. You come, follow me. And James and John would eventually realize this. You know, in the book of Acts, chapter 12, James is the first of the 12 apostles to lose his life for the gospel. And church tradition tells us that the apostle John, in his old age, lived to be a very old man. He, he, left, he ended his days in exile on a tiling island as a political prisoner. That's where we get the book of Revelation from, whenever he's on that island. They would suffer with Jesus. Well, the disciples, the other ten of the twelve disciples, they come, and they're kind of perturbed. It's not because they understand the theology right, they didn't. They critique James and John for misunderstanding. They're jealous. Right? You guys think you can ask for the position of honor? What about us? Well, in verse 42, Jesus has to have a seminar. He calls them together, and he teaches them yet again what discipleship entails. In verse 42, he says, You know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. Look at the world. Don't you see how they love their power? Don't you see how they're so boastful and they like to hold it over everyone else to let them know how much power they have? Right? They like to boast about how they can do whatever they want, unchecked, there's nothing that can stop them. The more power they have, the more they like to talk about it. Right? And they're kind of good at exploiting the nature of their position to get what they want and to build their own platform rather than using it to serve others. And brothers and sisters, if we aren't careful, we will be drawn into this allure for power. We will be drawn in thinking of what the power can accomplish for us rather than asking, what would Jesus do in this situation? How can I follow Jesus with what he's given me? Jesus says in verse 43, it shall not be so among you. It shall not be so among you. But whoever would be great among all of you must be a servant. And whoever would be first must become a slave. So this is the same message that Jesus has been teaching his disciples again and again and again in the last three chapters of Mark. Again, if you would be first, you must be last. If you would gain your life, you must lose it. True greatness is found in serving others. Should you grasp the position of power? Should you long for that? Do you want to be the most highly favored? Do you want your peers, your friends, your co-workers, your family members? Do you want them to pat you on the back and grovel at your feet? If these are your goals, then in the kingdom of God you will be horribly, horribly disappointed. Rather, Jesus uses strong language. We must become as servants, even going one step further to say, you must become a slave of all. Now, some people would say, well, is Jesus condoning slavery here? I don't think that's what he's doing at all. He's saying, you need to surrender your status. Whatever status you have, you need to hand it over. Because in the kingdom of God, God is calling you to serve everyone. And the type of unique authority that we have in the kingdom is that it's not that someone can force us to be a servant, but that we can willingly be a servant. We can willingly, willingly hand over our rights and love our neighbor as ourselves. We can hand over our rights and let Jesus reign as king, not just in our own life, but in our collective life. Maybe you would say, well, I'm not going to degrade myself for the sake of others. That's humiliating. But the greatest person of all did just this for us. And this is what Jesus says in Matthew 10, 45. Even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom, as a redemption for many people. Right? And no scene in Jesus' own life illustrates this more than the night before he was betrayed in the Gospel of John, chapter 13. Right? He was with his disciples that were taking their last meal together. And Jesus takes off his outer garment, gets a basin of water, and he goes around on his knees and washes his disciples' feet. And you might think, well, that's very nice of him. I would remind those who have athletes in the room, how does it smell whenever your athlete comes home and kicks off their basketball shoes? It's pretty stinky. And imagine if you live in a world where all you ever did was walk around barefoot or with sandals on, and there's a lot of dust. It'd be pretty nasty. And so foot washing was a very, very practical task. And normally the lowest person in the household would do it. The youngest child, the servant of the household, not the master. 
This offends the disciples of Jesus. But Jesus does it nevertheless, and he commands his disciples this in John 13, verses 13 and 15, through 15. Do you understand what I have done for you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you're right, for so I am. If then I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do just as I have done for you. Right? Often we ask ourselves, what's the least amount of work I can do to get through the day? Right, what's the least amount of effort I can put into this presentation so that it's successful work? The least amount of studying I can do and still pass the test? The least amount of practice and still win the game? But this isn't the right question. Right? The question that Jesus would ask us is, what more can I do? Who else can I serve? What more do I need to give for the sake of the kingdom? Right? And again, we think about what Jesus did for us. He gave his life as a ransom. That means he bought us back as a redemption. By his own death, this one who, uh, Isaiah 53, 12 says, He was numbered among the transgressors and bore the sins of many, and makes intercession for those very transgressors, for those who sinned against God. Although we've all fallen short of the glory of God, Jesus calls us to himself, and he gives his life for us and for our salvation. And in the end, we will have a type of glory, but we'll get it whenever the Lord returns. Well, we've seen Jesus' certain fulfillment of scripture, we've seen the certain faith of these disciples, glory and groaning. Now I want to look at the certain faith blind man who's able to truly see. So as soon as Jesus teaches this lesson, they go to the city of Jericho, which is on the way to Jerusalem. And there's a blind man there. He's named Bartimaeus. And as Jesus walks by, he cries out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Well, the crowds around, that's kind of embarrassing. You know, if you were a blind person, that was the really low status. You were a beggar. You weren't very popular. So they're trying to quiet that Bartimaeus. But he gets louder in his calling out. He says, Son of David, have mercy on me. And so Jesus summons him. And he runs to Jesus. And Jesus asks, asks him the same question that he asked James and John. What do you want me to do for you? What do you want me to do for you? And he simply asks for sight. Let me recover my sight. And Jesus looks at the man. And he says, Your faith has made you well. And immediately the man can see and he starts following Jesus. Mark highlights this healing of the blind man, I think, for a few reasons. First off, as we think about James and John, they ask Jesus for glory. But what does this man ask Jesus for? He asks for mercy. They start from a position of high status, but the beggar started from a position of low status. They believe that they are worthy to stand before Jesus. This man comes before Jesus and he knows he's not worthy to stand in his presence. After hearing about Jesus' own mission to die on the cross, they ask for glory. And they still can't see. But this blind man who can't see has faith that lets him see who Jesus really is. And he follows him with, a, with, a, he follows him with an abandonment. Right? It's, it's, in this whole scene, it's the blind man who truly sees, because he has faith. And so as we consider our own position with regard to Jesus, as we consider our own relationship with him, we might even be tempted to ask the same question of James and John. Would you give us the glory? Would you just let us have a little taste of it in this, on this earth, in this age? Or do we approach Jesus with the humility of the blind man? who simply cried out, Lord, have mercy on me. Have mercy on me, son of David. Or are we blinded by our own agenda? Are we blinded by our own ambition? Are we blinded by our sin? Rather than being caught up in the holy purposes of Jesus Christ. So as I come to a close, I have a few questions I want to ask you today. The first is this. Will you join Jesus on the road? Will you join Jesus on the road? He's going to Jerusalem. Will you go with him there? As we work towards Easter this year, I'm going to be preaching 
through the rest of the Gospel of Mark. And we're going to end at the cross. We need to go with Jesus there. And even more poignant, are you following Jesus today? Right, maybe you're here and you are feeling that Jesus is calling you in some way. Maybe he's calling you to be reconciled with somebody. To ask for forgiveness or maybe even to offer an apology. Are you... Jesus may be calling you today to serve in the church. I'm not saying he's calling you to quit your job and to go find employment by a church, but is he calling you to serve in the nursery, as a greeter, in the children's ministry? Is Jesus calling you? And even most important today, is Jesus calling you to make a commitment to himself? Do you trust Jesus Christ by faith? Have you ever repented of your sins and believed in him as your Savior? The good news is the Bible tells us if we do that, that Jesus will forgive us of our sins and will grant us the gift of eternal life. Earlier I asked the children, how can you add one foot to your height? How can you add one day to your life? The fact of the matter is, in our own strength, we can't. But if we trust in Jesus Christ, if we totally depend upon him, then Jesus will give us eternal life as a gift. We don't have to do anything to earn it. There's no amount of good deeds that we could do to earn this gift from God, but rather he gives it to us because Jesus gave his life as a ransom for many, that our sins and our transgressions might be forgiven. And so today, if you're here and you've never believed in Jesus, I would invite you to do so today. Repent of your sins, turn from them, and go unto Jesus Christ. I'm going to be standing down front in just a minute. If you would like to pray to receive Christ as your Savior, if you'd like to pray for anything else, I'll be standing right here. I'd love to pray for you. But if you would, please bow your heads with me, and let's go to our Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, so often we, just like your disciples, we make the same mistakes that they make. God, we think that following Jesus Christ will be the key to our success. That following Jesus Christ will solve all the problems that we have. And even more than that, maybe following Jesus Christ is going to let us be number one. God, we know that this is really driven by our own selfish longings. But rather, God, you have called us to humility. You have called us to take the position of a servant, to take the position even of a slave as we serve one another. It doesn't matter where we start off on the scale of privilege, whether we are at the top, whether we're a foot away from the bottom, or whether we're anywhere else, God, you have called us to go down for the sake of one another. God, we cannot do this in our own strength, and we need your help. So God, I pray that you would lead us in humility, that you would lead us to surrender our status just as you surrendered your own. And God, would you deliver us and give us mercy, we pray. In the name of your Son, Jesus.